Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this Climate Now Live here on Euronews YouTube channel. My name is Jeremy Wilkes. I make a program called Climate Now every month on Euronews, sharing the latest data from the Copernicus Climate Change Service. We're here to talk about citizen science and climate change and how you can help our planet. We're going to be talking about everything from bird watching in France and tree spotting in the Congo to deciphering old Danish shipping logs and loaning your computer to simulate the future of Earth. Please send us your questions, whatever you'd like to know, we will try to answer it. But now let's start to welcome our guests. Would you please introduce yourselves, starting with Gregoire. Hello, I'm Gregoire from France. I work in the National History Museum in Paris, and we run monitoring programs about birds, bats, uh, pollinators, uh, butterflies, etc., to track the impacts of uh, large-scale changes on biodiversity. Hi, I'm Kuhn Hoskins. I'm an ecologist at Inver Bordeaux, and I work on the recovery and the use of historical data in the study of tropical tree growth. Hi, I'm Sarah Sparrow um, from the University of Oxford, and I work for a project called climateprediction.net, where volunteers run weather and climate models on their home computers so that we can study extreme weather and climate change around the world. Hi, my name is Martin Stendel. I'm working at the Danish Meteorological Institute in Copenhagen, and together with my colleague Adam, we will try to digitize uh, old logbook data, which are uh, hidden in the archive. And for this, we certainly will need uh, citizen science help. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Joaquin Carrabo, <coughs> a marine conservation ecologist uh, working at the Institute uh, de Ciencias del Mar in Barcelona, here in Spain. And my research, uh, the focus of the things that I'm going to discuss today is promoting the role of marine protected areas as nature-based solutions to face uh, climate change. And for this, the implementation of marine citizen science programs, such as Observadores del Mar, which is uh, the, the point that why I'm here. And today uh, I'll be delighted to share my experience on the development of this uh, citizen, marine citizen science platform with you. Hi, Thank you. I'm Stefan Brönnemann from the University of Bern. And we use historical meteorological observations, some of which uh, we compile, some of which we rescue on our own, but some of which is digitized by citizen scientists uh, to generate global weather and climate data sets for the past, which we then can use to study large scale climate variations. Hi, my name is Adam Jon Kronik and I work at the National Archives of Denmark in the Science Service Unit, where the goal is to assist uh, researchers um, from health science and uh, from natural sciences with the uh, data uh, that is in the archives, uh, the enormous uh, collection of national archives. Um, and uh, our goal is to assist any researcher with the special types of data which can be identified in and is hidden in the huge collection of the National Archives. There are just so many hidden archives out there and so many interesting stories to tell. And please stay with us and send us your questions because we can then put them to the experts. If you fancy becoming a, a kind of a part-time climate scientist, um, then this is a very good place to start to learn about what's happening all around Europe. And as you can tell from that introduction, we really are all around Europe and all around the world. I want to bring up a graphic, um, the first one that we have here, which is going to show you, this is from the um, Copernicus Climate Change Service, showing us an in interactive map on their website of all of these different data rescue projects all around the world. So some of the projects we're going to be talking about today are data rescue, so that's old documents um, from the past which people are digitizing, and some of the other ones are about observations and getting out there in nature and seeing what's happening, and other ones involve staying at home and using your computer. Well, I think you'll probably have to use your computer for all of them. Anyway, let's, um, let's get on to the for me, one of the great original citizen scientists, the guy I was, I was virtually introduced to last week, um, uh, which, which, uh, who Adam has been um, been been looking at. Um, this is a uh, 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 number two here. We have um, Hagen Matteson, who is basically. Uh, let's bring up a photo of him. He's a general from Denmark, who he spent his time 
copying ancient logbooks and doing his own version of Excel, recording the weather. And Adam, you've been working with the data that he's generated and re recently discovered. Let's bring up a photo of him and t you can tell us about him, please. Well, he's a very interesting fellow. And uh, I was given a very uh, broadly defined task to try to uh, find the data that contained historical uh, measurements of t temperatures. And it turned out that we at the National Archives had a large number of uh, different submissions from many different institutions. Um, but one of the immediately mostly interesting was from the Danish Biological Station, uh, which I must admit that I've never heard about before. Uh, but they, uh, we found the four thick journals which were contained neatly kept uh, columns with endless uh, rows of incomprehensive uh, numbers. Uh, but it turned out that they were written by Hohen uh, Valdemar Matisen, a retired uh, general who after the war between Prussia and Denmark uh, in 1864, where Denmark suffered a major defeat. Uh, after that, the war, he was able to immerse himself with his true passion, which was transcription of logbooks from ships. And uh, Matisse was a very systematic. Uh, I usually claim that he invented the Excel sheet a uh, hundred years before the electronic edition. Uh, but Mat Matisse had a systematics and a thoroughness. And uh, then he obviously also had the necessary time available because his uh, passion was to track down logbooks and copy them. And he had an interest in, in something he called the color of the sea. And uh, his research had this focal point and the color of the sea had uh, many different influences and one of them was temperature. And, How uh, interesting. And so he, he's took, taken all of these bits of data and now you are attempting to kind of digitize them, is that it? Yes, because, well, it turned out that he had um, for more than, I believe there must be more than 30,000 uh, observations where he had registered the name of the ship and its position and the date and the temperature. And he also recorded various uh, natural phenomena um, which the helmsman uh, recorded in the logbook, um, such as icebergs and whales and special plant or seaweed uh, deposits. And where he got these logbooks from is a bit of a mystery, but there are, are more than uh, 30,000 individual registrations uh, dating back to the 18th century from a number of Danish and European and American ships. It is now a tricky business, but a fun task as well of attempting to digitize those and turn them into something useful, which is something you're, you're working with, together with Martin on. Martin, can you tell us a bit about the project and what you're doing? Yes, <clears throat> we have termed the project Ropewalk, so we get a maritime connotation. That stands for rescuing old data with people F people's efforts, weather and climate archives from logbook records. <laughs> Very long title. So the idea is, as uh, Adam already said, uh, to get the uh, weather information out of the logbooks. And here we have, uh, in principle, we have two different types of records. The older ones uh, are handwritten, longer texts, and I will tell about them in a moment. Uh, the newer ones, which uh, Adam will report on, these are tables, so numbers, which uh, are uh, comparably easy to uh, digitize because it's more systematic. Uh, the old ones, um, this is mainly uh, comes from two sources. Yeah, thank you. One source, I just uh, give one sentence and then I come back to this here. One source is uh, um, ships uh, travel to the colonies and the colony we are interested here is Greenland. Uh, there was a, um, a monopoly of the Greenlandic uh, merchants company, so nobody else uh, was allowed to do this. So there are information mainly from the Greenlandic West Coast uh, going quite way back in time. And uh, this has uh, not been digitized so far. And we have information about ice extent. We also have in the newer records uh, information about the sea surface temperature. And this is, of course, uh, of utmost importance. Then the old ones, they look like this. 
Um, many of them have to do with the Öresund duty. If you look at the map, you can see the island of Sealand, which belongs to Denmark in the middle, and to the right, that's Sweden. And in between, uh, there's the narrow strait of uh, Öresund, which at the narrowest uh, uh, place is only four kilometers. So uh, at the time when both sides belong to Denmark, the king could uh, build a castle on uh, each side and then uh, put a couple of cannons up to convince people to pay their duties. Um, to further enforce that, ships were placed. Uh, these are marked uh, with the red, no, sorry, with the yellow uh, markers in this map. And these ships had to uh, more or less cruise on a very uh, small area, so we know exactly where they were. And they had to report the weather because uh, obviously there were complaints that the people had, uh, didn't want to sail out. So the king actually enforced them in 1670 to uh, make these logbooks. And that is particularly interesting because. Uh, at every uh, shift, which takes four hours, every shift. So it's six times daily. They have made observations. And these observations actually consist of weather and of wind, both direction and velocity. So how do you do that with velocity? That's a bit tricky because they uh, recorded which sails they had put up. And the smallest uh, possible uh, rigging of the sails was, of course, what uh, just fitted uh, to uh, the wind they have observed. And if you once uh, again go back to the image, I can give a little example. So should be able to bring it back up again. So the, you've basically got to go through these logbooks and how you're going to scan them with a computer or you're going to read them or what will you do? Well, <clears throat> actually, uh, they will be everything will be scanned in the archives, in the National Archives. And then uh, we try to both uh, read them with uh, machine learning algorithms, which may work for the newer ones, but certainly not for the old ones. And uh, the old ones, actually, we are quite lucky. They have already, we have also some kind of Matisse. Uh, they have already uh, been analogically digitized, so to speak. So what uh, people did that was in the course of uh, almost 14 years, uh, they went into the National Archive, looked through all these logbooks, read the old text. Uh, no, actually not that one, the one before, uh, read okay. the old text. And tried to extract, yeah, thank you. If you look on the right hand side, the lower yellow marker, it says uh, S uh, O T O Steve Marcel's cooling, southeast to east, or almost easterly wind. And Marcel, uh, that's in English top sail. And, and this kind, it's the lower top sail. So that's the second sail from, uh, from the bottom. And that was the last sail which was put in when it became too windy. So the captain here writes in the logbook, it has been too windy. We couldn't uh, uh, carry on uh, with the fight against the Swedes. We can, uh, you know, that was on the 1st of October, uh, 1710, the uh, sea battle in Kuebukt, which is uh, right south of Copenhagen. And there was no winner because it was too windy. So in this case, we actually know uh, what it looks like. But if you look at uh, these uh, uh, at these examples, you can see it's handwritten text. So these people actually extracted it, put it into tables, and these tables, numbers, so to speak, these uh, are going to be digitized. That has actually never been done before. And what kind of insights do you actually get about the climate from that? Because you're getting the weather in Denmark at that time. So, so what? Is there not really any other information around? What kind of things can you find out about? Well, you have the two. It's two things uh, about the second one, newer data. Adam will talk in a moment. The older one, we cannot expect that we get any um, data coverage, which uh, is globally from 1675 or something like that. But actually, if you go back in time, prior to 1850, then it becomes quite, uh, there are large gaps. So everything is helpful. We cannot reconstruct the uh, climate of the world in 1715 or 1685. But what we can do is we can reconstruct the climate of the Baltic Sea region. And uh, that's what we are going to do with these. Uh, and there are actually plenty of observations. We are talking about something on the order of 22,000 pages. So there's lots of information. And as I said, six times daily. And since they had to be given to the king who controlled it, at least in principle, uh, we are confident that this data actually is, uh, to the amount possible, it is exact. Let's let's have um, have a look at uh, another one of those logs. And um, we can maybe talk about what it is that a, a citizen scientist who was involved in your project would actually have to do. And um, Adam sent through this, which shows us um, mm. a little bit of the information that you might have, ship name, date, position, temperature, 
various observations. Is this what they mostly look like, Ben? All kind of handwritten and relatively neat. The newer ones, yes. Yeah, and so, uh, and Adam, we, are, these things, are these things fragile? Are they are they, or, or, are they easy to handle? They are, uh, but they have been scanned now, so um, <laughs> we are not afraid to use them. But actually, okay. um, we had to vacuum clean them for fungus uh, because they were very old and they'd been stored and tucked away for great many years. So, but uh, they are kept safely now at the National Archives. <laughs> they had a rather distinctive smell then, is what you're <laughs> suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got more of this stuff out there, or with, is this project with Martin going to find pretty much most of the, the good quality data that you have? Oh, we have so much, um, and we keep finding more and more. And uh, I, I think that it's been a... We never really realized how much maritime data that was could be useful for weather, restoring uh, old weather observations were to be found at the National Archives. Uh, but since Denmark and Greenland has this historical relation, um, we've identified um, several hundreds of logbooks um, with ship uh, sailing in between Denmark and Greenland, and these are just uh, ready. They're ready for uh, harvesting. So oh, they found a lot. I mean, it's such a great project. I'm going to get on and talk to everybody else a little bit now. But we sure. can, if you have questions uh, about that project in particular, obviously um, send them through and we'll ask them. Um, let's bring up um, a, another image, though, that I think is just is, is something that's kind of become quite iconic now, which is this image that you have from Ed Hawkins, who's very involved in citizen science showing global temperature change since 1850. Um, this wonderful visualization that he did in these the famous stripes, climate stripes. Um, and he's somebody who's very involved in these, uh, in attempting to yeah, get uh, the whole world really involved in understanding climate and more and more people involved in, in these sorts of projects. Um, but I, I think what's interesting as well from that image is that we've got data from uh, 150 years or so is that it, really, when it comes to good quality data? Who wants to have a go at answering that one? I mean, is that it, really, the last 150 years? Maybe Stefan. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not an accident that is the last 150 years. So we have the emergence of the nation states. We have um, new responsibilities and also new technologies like telegraphy that starts to um, come in. And this is really necessary to really maintain a good network. There were so many attempts earlier on to make networks, but they all failed because really uh, operating a network is very difficult. So uh, on a global scale, high quality data or climate quality data is 1850. But of course, you want to go further back. And uh, Martin mentioned that it's very difficult to, to have a global view of the early um, 18th or even late 17th century. Uh, but we try the best we can to use these data that have been collected by individuals, by doctors frequently, uh, by priests, sometimes missionaries, scientists, um, etc. But also early networks, there were several attempts to really get everything we can to come to a, a reconstruction of climate. It is, I suppose, a, a, a massive challenge to um, be sure about the quality, but I was actually reading something about this earlier and that suggests that the quality of citizen science is actually very high now, is considered to be very high, and that the sort of error rate and things like that is sort of uh, something you can manage. Is that something you, you confirm? Um, if you ask me, well, we have much bigger error sources than that, yes. So uh, with, you, you always have the, um, the option to replicate um, in citizen science projects. You can have many people doing the same sheet over again and see how good they match and uh, this is done. And this is certainly not uh, um, the quality issue we have. So dealing with historical observations carries many other problems that we try to fix from instruments to observing routines to reporting practices and many other issues so um, the quality of the citizen science itself is the least um, worry for us 
Okay, uh, let's talk about um, uh, what's happening now. We've got some biodiversity projects here and uh, some biodiversity experts. So let's talk to, to Gregoire about, about his work in France, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And it's going to bring up an image um, of actually some of your, uh, some of your people at, at work out in the field. Um, Gregoire, tell us a little bit about what you, uh, what you actually do and uh, um, with the projects that you've got going on at the moment. So what we do is we try to push people to to participate into citizen science, which are very standardized. People have to follow very strict protocol. We thought at the beginning, like for example here, we can see that uh, some uh, amateur botanists are uh, doing some uh, sampling and uh, because here in this, uh, because it's quite hard to get an estimate of the abundance of uh, taxa flora, what we do is that we ask them to do some replicates in a five per two meters rectangle and there are 10 replicas of one square meter. And we use, for example, as a proxy for abundance of uh, flora taxa, we use the number of, square, of, uh, of uh, one meter, one square meter squares that are uh, occupied by this or this taxa. What is good to know is that it can be, uh, well, we, 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 don't, we, we don't care for easiness of uh, citizen science and it can be painful. In fact, those people which were monitoring uh, vascular plants uh, did not choose the site. They are, they, they, there is a random choice and we say, well, you go there and then it's, it, they have a one kilometer square uh, grid. They choose a grid and in this grid, there are systematic positions for uh, vascular plant samplings. And what we could, for example, with this specific programs, we've got the same for uh, bats, for example, birds, butterflies, uh, bumblebees, uh, pollinators, other whole um, uh, earthworms or whatever. What we could see with plants, for example, is that, and, and, and we will see the same kind of results with butterflies and, and birds in the example where we thank uh, um, participants. What we could see with as a, the, the very last results, which came last year, is that in fact, the community of plants are very affected by uh, climate change, which means that in France at the national level, the, the plants that have a kind of a northern envelope do, do, do tend to decrease while plants with a thousand envelope do tend to increase. So that's quite obvious. We are, of course, we, we, given, given, given the temperature, we did not expect something else. But if we can go on the, on the slide with the, the birds and butterfly, I will explain something about uh, this. I'm afraid, I don't know whether I have that one. I have the, I do have oh, the slide. Yes, it's the one with the thanks. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, Let's with the, that with the acknowledgements okay, to the okay. participants. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah, so on top left, we have what we call a climatic depth of biodiversity. It means that, in fact, even for the most plastic uh, taxa groups, the, 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 the biodiversity taxa groups don't go as fast as climate does. And this is a kind of problem because it gives some uh, inconsistencies in uh, in, uh, in synchronizations. For example, it has been it has been shown 20 years ago with uh, uh, pied flycatcher in Sweden that uh, the pied flycatcher did come back from Africa at the same time, but the, but the caterpillars did uh, that are used to feed the chicks are just were one week earlier. And this this did cause some decrease in the in the pine file catcher populations in Sweden, for example. And is that the kind of thing that you only found out about because you were working with these citizen science kinds of projects? There were, you know, depth of observations. Uh, you mean you mean if uh, this is only possible with uh, citizen science? Well, is it? I mean, I suppose it can't only be possible, but is it, I guess citizen science must be helping those kinds of observations in terms of breadth and depth, right? Yeah, sure. Be, uh, j just the scale, the time scale and the space scale are just unreachable with usual uh, science uh, ways or, or, or means. And how so many people have you got working with you in your Vision Nature project now? It's uh, it's around fifty thousand in France, so it's not much because uh, we are sixty-seven millions. But uh, but 
it's not it's not as much, for example, as as the involvement in UK, which is in citizen science, is really huge. But but we try to to have them those fifty thousand to follow very strict protocols, like dates are not chosen, sites are not chosen. There are sampling strategies, and uh, it gives. Well, we have less data, but we try to have uh, very standardized data, and we tr and, and we keep track of possible errors. That is that we uh, we ask people to to give us some uh, some proof of what they saw, like pictures, recording, whatever, and to to describe what they heard or what they see on the pictures, so that we can. It's not just for control; it's to have an estimation of error that we can take into account in models. That's so fascinating, really. Then, what I love about the uh, your project is that you were able to show us here in that in that image that that you've had a paper published with the acknowledgement for the citizen scientists in it, um, which must be hugely satisfying for them as well to feel that they've contributed to something. Yes, yeah, sure. It, it, I, I hope it was satisfying. Well, I, I'm one of the volunteers, of course. So I know it was satisfying, but it was also satisfying for the researchers that did publish these papers, because just to be able to say that, OK, we've got a kind of three million records of butterflies in garden, we could do a major publication and major findings with this. And we can ask now the, the scientific journals to 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 dedicate some space in the journal to, to thank the participants, which are just uh, indispensable. I mean, the, the paper would not have happened without this participation. I think uh, it's so interesting as well, particularly on this topic of biodiversity and climate change as well, to have that range of views is because it's somewhere where there's a lot of need for research and observation on the ground. Let's move on to Spain, actually, and talk about the oceans. Um, with uh, Joaquim Garabu, who's down there with his Observadores del Mar project. Um, tell us a bit about the project, and then I'm going to bring up the scary fish. And uh, But tell us quickly about your, your project. <laughs> OK. Uh, Observadores del Mar is a, a marine citizen science platform, and uh, we want to generate a, a tool uh, and a community to work on um, on these uh, different projects, which are devoted to three main goals. Uh, the first one is to um, try to understand what are the changes and uh, the impacts of uh, uh, human activities in the ocean. Uh, the second one is to track and monitoring uh, the fate of uh, emblematic species, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, some sharks or some uh, the novel pink shell in, in the Mediterranean. And the third goal is uh, collecting uh, more large scale um, information about biodiversity on, on different groups. We don't have so many volunteers, uh, but we use this, uh, this uh, approach of uh, proposing simplified by, by proof uh, protocols to collect uh, the data. So it ranges from uh, the application of some protocols till the, uh, the simple uh, observation and taking pictures of the of the species or uh, the plastic pollution, for instance, on, on, the, on the beaches. And then the platform allows uh, the people, the participants, to upload this information. And then for each project, we have a team of uh, scientists who, who are validating uh, this information. And the picture that you just showed us uh, before is about uh, uh, this scary fish that uh, uh, it's the family from the puffer fishes. And it's uh, one of the major uh, uh, impacts or consequences of uh, warming, warming in the Mediterranean is the, and the human activities. This species is originally from um, uh, the Red Sea and entered through the uh, Suez Canal in the Mediterranean not so long ago. Uh, it's, uh, the, the most reliable information that we have is that they entered in 2003, so it's less than uh, uh, 20 years. It's already causing a lot of the problems in the eastern part of the Mediterranean because this um, this species is um, uh, besides that if uh, if it beats you you will have a really um, nasty uh, uh, injuries but besides of this if you eat it if you fish it and you eat it uh, then it has a powerful uh, toxin uh, from the family of tretodotoxin which is really 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 serious and uh, even it can cause uh, the death so so this uh, 
causing the, the entrance of this uh, species in the Mediterranean, along with many others that uh, uh, made the Mediterranean Sea is a hot spot for the introduction of uh, species. And this, when they become invasive, like uh, the puffer fish in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, causes a lot of problems with the fishermen and with the people that go to the field. And yeah. thanks to the observation, just as I'm finishing on this, yeah. Jeremy, that thanks to the observation of this uh, citizen, we can track the, the colonization dynamics of these species in the Mediterranean. And this observation that it was shown in the, in the, in the picture is uh, from a record uh, in 2017, so less than uh, about uh, 15 years after the enter. This species is about to go out the Mediterranean and start uh, spreading in the Atlantic Sea. So this is really important to understand how, how it's going on. Right. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't. I really grasped the implications of that observation, being that it might be going out and and making its way along the coast. Um, and it, it, yeah, I mean, if you this it's a silver-cheeked toadfish. I looked it up earlier. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called in yeah. English. The kind of mm -hmm. the casual name it goes by. But apparently, they're breeding and doing very well. And if you eat one, yeah, you might get paralyzed and die. Um, and yeah. it's come through the Suez Canal. But it isn't, is it necessarily a climate change effect or is it just something that's happened to have happened because of the Suez being there? Or is it? Well, of, of, of course it happened because the Suez Canal is there, otherwise it cannot uh, yeah. fly, uh, the, the fish. Yeah. But, uh, what <laughs> well. but the, the warming uh, that, we're, that we're experiencing in the Mediterranean, you know that the Mediterranean is a hot spot for the climate change and uh, it's uh, warming at uh, three to five uh, times uh, faster than the mean of the ocean. So uh, this tropical fish uh, introduced himself in the Mediterranean, but uh, for the past, the waters were colder, so it was not so good for them. But now the, the waters are uh, warmer and warmer, so they, they, they like at home, so they can uh, develop uh, really easily. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing that you would, I um, imagine, be very happy to have people taking part in your project and observing where they're going. Because I, re I read online that they'd spotted one of those in France, but maybe that was an isolated case. I guess these kinds of projects like yours are, are ways to work out whether something's an isolated case or not. Because um, although in perhaps the, the public imagination, you guys are out sort of swimming around in the sea every day and i'm sure that i know that you like doing that as often as you can but that <laughs> isn't actually the case you're not out every day you're not out uh, observing like you are here in this nice photo we took <laughs> of you in september um so you know you need citizen science is that the case yeah i mean uh, the the power i mean for me uh, being implicated in uh, citizen science projects is uh, it has three main reasons the first one is uh, the empowerment and the enhancement of the observation capacity, both in space and, and time, this uh, we can, as uh, for the case in the terrestrial uh, project, uh, we cannot. The scientific teams we, we will never we will never reach the, this potential. The second uh, pillar is uh, the the raise awareness because through these projects we can reach many people and uh, explain what are the environmental issues that are affecting the, the ocean. And then we can, if we raise concern and, or raise awareness, we can uh, propose some measures. And then the third pillar is uh, this. Uh, uh, working on the dialogue between the, the, the scientific community, uh, the different stakeholders and the policymakers and try to find uh, solutions. And this is uh, really powerful from the citizen science can try to this uh, process uh, really powerful. If I was, um, I mean, I don't really know anything much about, about uh, oceanography or, or diving or anything like that. But if I was somebody who lived by the sea and was curious about what I could contribute, could you, could you start, could you get started quite easily without very much specialist knowledge? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the, 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 the 15 projects that we have in the platform, it, uh, it can serve different tastes of what I would say. So there are, there are even, uh, this is not only focused for uh, recreational divers, it's, uh, it's people that go on kayak, for instance, and they can make observation on jellyfishes or people walking on the, on the beach, they can see jellyfishes or, or, or the arrival of different species. Uh, even we have a powerful or successful project on uh, microplastic uh, uh, pollution uh, that is driven uh, mainly through the school so the students go to the beach and uh, uh, apply a, a, a protocol to
Oh, we seem to have lost you there. Monitor, there you go. that is. You, yes. got, you, you, got, so, you got cut off, sorry. Okay, no problem. Now it's fine? Yeah, 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 you're yeah. fine. Carry on, sorry. So there is a, a project on uh, that is uh, through the, the schools and uh, the students go to the beach and monitor the, uh, the, the, the abundance of microplastics or plastics in the, in, the, in the beaches. So this is really important because we have this follow-up follow up on, on what's going on in the beaches. Besides that, we are introducing the students to the uh, scientific uh, method and raise awareness and consensus about uh, the way uh, the, the impacts of uh, our activities. So this is really powerful, and I mean this applies to all the different projects that we are in uh, that we have in the in the Observatories del Mar platform. Yeah. No, it seems absolutely great. Um, and uh, I would, if I live by the sea, then I'd love to be taking part in this. Although, <laughs> but I, I don't. And um, for those of you who, you know, don't really fancy going out and uh, observing nature, you'd rather be inside with your computer, then I think Sarah might have a project for you. Sarah, tell us a bit about your project, what you're doing, and uh, the kind of fascinating network all around the world that you're building. Yeah, so um, our project is a bit more for the, the, the as you said, the passive uh, citizen science scientist. Um, so what we do is we, we use idle time on people's home computers so that we can run um, weather and climate model simulations. Um, so we run models from the UK Met Office and also from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And um, we look at all different types of um, extreme weather around the world. Um, and the reason that we need citizen scientists in order to do this is so that we can get very, very large numbers of simulations um, because we're really trying to look at these, these sort of rare um, extreme events that are happening. So the, the floods and the heat waves and um, wildfires and these sorts of things, are, are disasters that are, that are happening around. And we're trying to assess how much or whether or how much climate change is actually changing the likelihood or the, the occurrence of these extreme events and how they may well be changing in future. Um, and if we can get the information on, on how they, they will change in future, then we can hopefully provide useful information to stakeholders and, and policy makers about um, you know, ways in which they may need to reinforce or, or do sort of adaptation strategies in order to um, improve the population's sort of susceptibility I'm to about these why different you types turn to of citizen extremes. science to fix these problems because i would imagine you're in oxford they must have some pretty nice powerful computers there at the university can't they just do that on their sort of university devices why do they need to have me at home with my little computer working away on things yeah, sure. I mean, again, you can do really um, large, you, you, you can run things on, on sort of supercomputers, um, but it's a little bit like um, not necessarily the best tool. We want to save the um, sort of powerful supercomputing resources for really the all bells and whistles um, models that are out there that, that really need all these resources. When we're, we've we can run these models on people's home computers. And what we really need is very large numbers of simulations so that we can um, see all the variability um, that's in the weather and climate system that's out there so that we, we can work out what this is. And, and really that's not even feasible for us to do at this sort of scale on a, a supercomputer. So by having citizens donate their, their time for us, then we can get sort of many thousand members of ensembles, which is just like a dream for many of our scientists in order to be able to um, work I'm just going to bring data. up the, um, the image which we have, uh, which shows your network, which you're building, uh, which you have built, sorry. Just tell us about the number yeah. of people and where they are. Um, so um, the, the, on this on this graphic, that all of the yellow dots is a, a member of the public that's um, donating idle time on their computer um, for our project. Um, mainly, we're we're kind of focused in in sort of Europe and, and North America, but we're sort of spreading out globally. Um, we do actually, you know, you can't really quite see it very well on this this particular image, but there there is, I promise you, a yellow dot on the um, Antarctic Peninsula. Um, where somebody signed up a, uh, a computer to run simulations for us at the British Antarctic Survey. 
Um, so me, me with my with my getting on for six or seven year old computer, could I be helpful for you in any way <laughs> with that old machine? Uh, yes, definitely you could. Um, you know, we've we've got um, various different types of of models that we run. Some require kind of more resource than others, but we the project as a whole is you know it's quite configurable for how much time you actually. Um, want to spend sort of on your computer if you're going to be using your computer for other things you can say you know don't don't try and compute the model at this time you know do it when is it I'm quite busy. easy to use because I'm I mean I love my computer but I don't really understand it is it quite easy for us to very easy it? very easy you just sort of sign up to the project and if that's what you want to do you can leave it at that and it will kind of go itself and um sort of download models and and run them and and send data back to us um but you can also get involved in the in the forums and have sort of discussion with the other other scientists uh, or other volunteers that are, are running um models and, and find out about the types of different experiments that we're doing um and also as well you can find out which publications um sort of scientific publications that your um idle time has actually your computing time has oh, actually really? donated to towards so you can That's link right. um and find out what what you've contributed to as well as having a, an acknowledgement in the paper so that um, must be really great that's for, that's a, uh, i love the idea of that so yes it'll kind of work away and I don't really need to do anything, and I, but I can feel like I'm contributing to something large and important to do with understanding yes. the yes. future scenarios for the planet. Definitely. Yeah. Let's move on to um, Africa, to the Congo, or but via Belgium, in fact, to Kuhn, because one of the things that comes up, in fact, from looking at some of the maps that we've got is we've got data for, um, for Europe, we've got data for North America, not so much for Africa. You're trying to fill in some of the gaps. Tell us a bit about your project. Uh, you've got your mic uh, off at the moment. There you go. Hi. So, <laughs> similar to some of the projects here, I'm looking at doing the same kind of filling it, filling in gaps in historical uh, climate records for Congo. So, uh, a lot of data has been recorded in the past um, during uh, you know colonial times. So when when uh, Congo was still part of a uh, you know, Belgian colony, basically. And this, this data was recorded to, you know, by various government institutes, uh, ranging from uh, the meteorological service to start with, but also um, agronomical institutes. And uh, for example, uh, missionaries contributed data as well. And all that data was kind of gathered, gathered up and sent out to Brussels, but since then has kind of stayed in the archives and nothing has done with it. So we were left with this uh, tremendous amount of information which has hit its use in the past during that time, but since then has not been touched. And so uh, there, there have been a few efforts to kind of digitize this data and do something with it, but no kind of extensive uh, push to kind of cover most of it. And so uh, a couple of years back, uh, I got some funding to kind of digitize most of the archive, uh, and that's now a record of 75,000 scans, such as the one shown here. And so it includes a number of parameters. You know, generally, it's minimum and maximum temperature and uh, precipitation. Now, this on one was on a special day, day right? Um, this was in February 1933, like, and they had an eclipse. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so you find little gems like that all over the record. So where scientists and, and observers in general, because they were not necessarily dedicated scientists, like I said, they could be missionaries or people working at an airport. Um, they would make little notes in 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 you know in a margin, if you will. And so in this case, there was a a, a partial solar eclipse uh, in 1933. And so it's little gems like this you find. Um, but yeah, you've got tons of data there. So I've calculated or did a quick back of the envelope calculation and it's roughly 50 million uh, values. So table cells that need to be transcribed, which is a, a obviously an enormous amount. And you're of, asking of work. people to help you with that. So, right? well, that's what you have been doing. Yeah. 
Um, and let's bring up exactly. the interface actually, yeah. so we can sort of see what your system for citizen science looks like, because um, I think it's quite interesting to try and understand what you'd have to do if you were taking part in this project. Can you explain what we can see there? Yeah, so this is this is a, a header, so the top of a, a sheet or a table, basically, and it contains data on like the location and and generally uh, the year and the month in which the observation uh, was made. Also, uh, yeah, in the table below you have then the days. Um, but this this metadata is critical to kind of give every every sheet or every table kind of a place in in you know the the whole record. And in this case, you have to transcribe. Uh, you know, the month in which things happen, the year in which things happen, and also the, the, the post or like the number or the index that was given to a particular station. And so that allows me to kind of figure out which records kind of fit together. Uh, generally, in the archives, uh, people have already gone through uh, the records and kind of sorted uh, the records by number and by station. But just to cross-reference if everything was done correctly, um, because it's a manual process and, and uh, the records are public so people can consult them and so things can get shuffled. Uh, I do have to verify if, you know, the, the headers are, are correct or, or the sequences are correct. So that's that's a part of the task that people will be presenting in, in, in addition to the What have you actually learned so model. far about the climate there in the Congo? Because I, I report a lot on climate news, but I'm often focusing on Europe, what's happening there or what's happening in the Arctic in areas where there's dramatic changes. What sorts of things are actually happening in more like the Congo? Um, well, currently there there is a drying trend, so uh, I think it's very important to understand where we're coming from, and that's in that's actually the the major contribution, I guess, like filling in those gaps and and providing a frame of reference, uh, not only for climatologists because I'm technically not a climatologist, I'm an ecologist, and and for me this data is important because it gives a, a frame of reference within the context of for example, how trees have grown in the past, but also currently, and this allows us to kind of, com you know, compare those two time frames and see how. And that, how what how differences have you seen? What what differences are there in trees from 1933 to trees from 2020? Uh, well, that's what I'm working on, so I'm trying <laughs> to fill in that gap. But um, the expectation would be that basically growth would be a bit troubled because trees get stressed when they're you know, they don't have enough uh, water to use or it's extremely dry outside or drier than what they're used to. Um, but obviously you can't tell anything about such a comparison if you don't have that reference data to, to work from. Uh, and so that's, uh, I guess that's, that's the importance of that data, not only within the climatological context, but also within uh, the larger scope of ecological research. And, and, yeah, and, it's, uh, it's interesting biology. though. I mean, are, are you, um, have you recruited a lot of people to help you? Is it you finding it's quite easy to get people involved in this in this kind of project? Yeah, so the uh, the project that I've set up uh, is hosted at Zooniverse. Um, they have a platform which allows scientists to easily design their own little project. And um, it was launched through that platform and I, I got like 2,300 something in that order uh, of people to contribute to the project. Um, it's still ongoing, so there will be a new release of data, so that number is probably going to grow. Um, surprise, well, actually not so surprising. The project was coincidentally launched um, uh, last March, which ended up with, you know, being a period when a lot of people were at home, uh, having not much time on their hands. So uh, I guess things were, um, went really fast because of that. So. Um, yeah. No, but it's interesting though because anybody who might have a, a, a an interest in in history, but but somebody who's also from your field or somebody who's in climate might want to get involved in in this, or just you know just the process of kind of the relaxing process, I would imagine, of sitting down with this data and going through it and trying to understand it, imagining what was happening to those people back then. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to Switzerland to talk to to Stefan, who's going to I hope explain to me why all of this citizen science is actually helpful what are the big gaps there are in our understanding um of you know past weather and what what does that really mean for our understanding of climate change uh, make sure your mic is um you is switched on 
thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we are interested in, in, in such gaps. There are, of course, still many gaps, especially when it comes to um, like decadal scale variability of climate, uh, why some periods in the past were um, flood rich, um, some not, uh, why there were long lasting droughts, for instance. We were interested also in the mechanisms of the of the whole machinery of the climate system. How do monsoons relate to uh, the climate of Europe, for instance? Um, and for that, we need long records. And we also have new tools to to make use of the data. I think this is an important um, fact to take into account for a long time. The main use of such historical records was to have one long time series that you can compare current climate with. But now we have tools to really make use of short segments of of um, climate records, stitch them together to get like a more dynamic view of past climate. And with that, we can we can we can fill in gaps. One of them is, for instance, the early 19th century where we had many volcanic eruptions a whole sequence of eruptions and we want to understand what happened to the to climate system as a whole how did the oceans react how did the monsoons react etc so for that we need we need all these data it's uh, I, i'm getting one of the questions i had is kind of slightly climate skeptic sounding i suppose but it's basically you saying well you know we, we've gone we've gone back a few hundred years but you know the planet's changed and its climate's changed over thousands and thousands of years is there any way of kind of going much further back and do we need to go much further back or if we've got 150 years of really good data like we were talking about at the beginning and the fact that people have been taking things in a more methodical way in the last 150 years is that enough to be pretty sure about things and to make more kind of really firm statements about about what our climate is really like on very very big time scales i mean for for us as a society uh the relevant time scales are within the past 150 years. But to find out climate processes, we we may need longer time periods. As I said, um, such things like sequences of volcanic eruptions, when you have five, six eruptions in a, in a short period, this did not happen in the 20th century. So um, for to, to study that, uh, we need uh, long records. And also um, there are other examples of, of, of long lasting drought, for instance. But of course, the last um, 150 years, they have this huge trend in it that we uh, can compare with past climate. And we do not find anything like that in the past. We, the past doesn't help us to find an analog for the future. There is no analog for that. That's really interesting, and that's pretty powerful, I suppose, because um, certainly a lot of the comments that we get when we have these these conversations and these lives here on YouTube, people are kind of questioning the science and coming up with other ideas about how the the climate may have changed. Um, how do you how, how do you in the kind of th this world how do you face up to that? Does that happen to you? Do you have face people who might be I suppose skeptical, uh, might describe themselves as climate skeptics, and how do you handle them? Well, I mean, it, it's it's of course always good to ask questions, and um, uh, uh, of course we get these questions. That's clear. I think um, for the warming that we that we observe um, since uh, the 1950s or 1970s, we have a very good observing systems. We have satellites in space since the 70s. We have really high quality data. We do not need um, more uh, or better information from the, the past to um, confirm that. Uh, but what is, over the for, what is sometimes forgotten is that um, we also have variability in top, on top of climate change. So we, uh, we do have decayal changes and we would like to, to be able to forecast changes or to, to say something about the probability of, of, of a long lasting drought, for instance. And this is something where, where we need long records. Yeah, absolutely. And those ancient ship records, the things we started talking about at the beginning, are those sorts of things are going to give you that picture on variability, right, over a, a long scale that you can start to make pretty clear statements about what you think will happen. Um, where, where are the other archives out there hiding the people that uh, you, and um, this is kind of an ad address to those who are looking at rescuing old data, where are the, the archives out there that you'd love to start digging into? Where are their stores of information 
that that's kind of hidden somewhere that nobody's really got around to digitizing yet. Um, Colonel Adam, maybe you've got something to say about that. Well, traditionally, as uh, archivists, we've been very proud of our beautiful records. Uh, but we may also have been a little frustrated that the outside world did not fully share our passion. Uh, but we have now uh, very slowly uh, recognized that this uh, may be because the outside world has absolutely no idea uh, what we have stored. And that's what we now try to change uh, because we are convinced that uh, we are guarding a gold mine of data and we really want to share this with everyone and to contribute to uh, research projects wherever we can. So our ambition is for researchers to consider uh, the National Archives as potential uh, data providers for future uh, are they literally, research projects. Are, they, are we literally talking main... about piles of old, yellow, slightly moldy, strange-smelling paper? Is that what it is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but also, uh, we have um, 150 terabytes of data, um, electronic data. We have 4,500 um, uh, uh, databases, and nobody really knows what these contain. So it's just, I, I will tell, uh, my job is to um, see if I can find data and then to to share this with the uh, scientists who may uh, be able to use this for some uh, science project. Um, so just be aware that the National Archives are there and uh, we are a gold mine of, uh, of data just I'm waiting for to be identified. I'm absolutely to come and have a route around and see what interesting things there are. I went to Spain and, uh, and did a story about this last year and it was fascinating looking back at these old bits of paper, which I, again, yeah, they were sitting there in piles, um, being digitized, but they were, yeah, they were exactly how you imagine them to be. I want to, to, to finish, I'm just gonna quickly go around um, everybody and uh, I'd like you to just, Tell us quickly how we can get involved in your project um, and just you know, what you need to have, what you need to do, how do you get involved? And um, let's start, um, I'm, think, I'm looking at the people around me. I'm gonna start with the person straight above me, Sarah. Tell us how do we get started in your, in, in your project? Um, well, it's quite simple. If you go to um the www.climateprediction.net um, then there's information about how to get um, signed up onto the platform there and then you can sort of start straight away kind of downloading models and, and running simulations for us and we've got some new models or, or some new experiments that will be coming online next year looking particularly at European uh sort of extreme weather and and hazards in response to warming in the arctic um as part of a that's project a super hot that's topic, which takes me up to this man here who'd be very interested in that martin um how do we get involved in your future project about danish archives microphone need to switch it on I should point out that we not yet have started, but once we have started, actually we do not intend to reinvent the wheel. So that means uh, we use the uh, well-established uh, Zooniverse uh, approach um, by Kevin Wood from uh, NOAA and uh, Ed Hawkins uh, from Great Britain. So uh, we will try to see how much uh, we can uh, digitized by automatized uh, solutions because that has uh, made uh, major progress during the last couple of years. But there will certainly be a large amount which we will solve with these. Now, meanwhile, one okay. would call and it a standard on this approach. Side. There we go. There we are. <laughs> I'm going to touch you if I could reach any further. Ken? Okay. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to echo Martin on this one. So for my project, it's the same. Um, uh, it's hosted on Zooniverse. I didn't reinvent the wheel either. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, it's called Jungle Weather. And if you don't find uh, anything to do there, because it's technically, uh, I mean, between batches of, of data, uh, I think you will find something else to do as well. Gregoire, tell us about how you can get involved with your projects. 
Well, unfortunately, you have to speak French to get involved, but that's the the the, the very uh, unique condition you have to meet because we have uh, programs which are open to even to non-naturalists that just wish to discover. And for example, there is uh, the one which is currently going on uh, on winter birds is called Bird Lab, and it's you you play on your smartphone in front of your. Uh, of your garden bird feeders and you reprodu reproduce during five minutes interactions between individuals very easy okay. but in french sorry the easiest sure way to find us is to use google french, you know i think we'll be okay um uh Joaquim, how, how do we get involved with your observador still project yes uh, you you can search on uh, google it in uh, observadores del mar and uh, the platform is in spanish catalan and english so the people uh, even the tourists that come to spain or that go around the mediterranean or outside the mediterranean they can there are some projects that go beyond the mediterranean so they can upload the the the, the observations and it's open to uh, anyone that uh, the only condition is that you have to go near the sea or inside the sea well uh, Over, that isn't really near, too bad I mean, it sounds like a very pleasant <laughs> thing to do and it's a very nice part of the world catalonia so i could imagine yeah. being being involved with that is pretty nice <laughs> thank you yeah Thank you, everybody, <laughs> for taking part in this. Uh, it's been really interesting learning about the activity in uh, citizen science in Europe, I think, it's specifically, because there's an awful lot online you can read about about how to get involved in projects in the States. And if you if you start searching, that's generally what you tend to find. There's a lot in the UK too. It seems there's also some great projects all around Europe. So thank you everybody for being with us. Um, it's been a real pleasure. We'll be back next month in 2021 with uh, more of these lives um, talking about different topics related to the climate. And of course, you can always see the latest news about what's happening to our planet at euronews.com slash climate now. And I'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.